Hi, welcome to the Second Rainbow Coalition Reading Group. We are currently reading The Young Lords by Joanna Fernandez. Um, we will be starting today on chapter seven, but first we will be reading the Statement of Unity for the Second Rainbow Coalition. Uh, the preface is, the US was founded as a colonial settler state based upon white supremacy and slavery, stealing the lands of indigenous nations, breaking every treaty made with them and confining them to reservations, AKA concentration camps. As the country became more powerful, the Eagles sunk its claws into other nations, making war on Mexico and grabbing its Northern territory, invading Cuba, Puerto Rico, Hawaii, and the Philippines, and either annexing them outright or making them colonies or neo-colonies. And in the 20th century, it became the major imperialist power in the world, exploiting both the people within its boundaries and those in every other country, bullying them with military interventions and robbing them of their right to self-determination. As Huey P. Newton stated, we have two enemies to fight, racism and capitalism. Between the two, capitalism is primary. Racism is a byproduct of capitalism. The working people of the world of every ethnicity or nationality face a common enemy that is destroying life on earth. Our enemy is the small ruling class of property owners controlling most of the world's wealth and resources. We must have our basic needs met to live a good and meaningful life. Food, shelter, healthcare, education, freedom from oppression by the state, and peace with other nations. To obtain these essential things for life, we must have the power to see to it that the abundance that is available is shared equitably. Statement of Unity for the Second Rainbow Coalition. The legacy of the First Rainbow Coalition dates back to its founding on April 4th, 1969 by the original Black Panther Party, original Young Lords, and Young Patriots Organization. A number of other organizations joined this coalition not too long afterwards, such as the American Indian Movement, Brown Berets, Rising Up Angry, the Red Guards, and others. Since the founding of the United States, the masses had developed a number of popular movements that came together to fight back against this capitalist imperialist system in various ways around particular demands. Nevertheless, none had established a movement quite like the First Rainbow Coalition. This historic movement was the first of its kind that established a model of class struggle like no other, <clears throat> excuse me, like no other. <clears throat> its charismatic leader, Chairman Fred Hampton of the Illinois chapter of the original Black Panther Party, stated that at the end of the day, we weren't engaged in a quote, race struggle. He said, it's a class struggle, goddammit. By uniting with the various ethnic communities that white supremacy had long sought to keep divided, this class solidarity equipped them with the material basis and class consciousness to see their common class condition. Therefore, the necessity to form a united front against the common class oppressor, the capitalist imperialist ruling class. The ruling class viewed this as the greatest threat to their class rule and subsequently used the entire repressive forces of the state, the police, courts, jails, prisons, and intelligence agencies, etc in order to crush this emerging revolutionary socialist movement. We refounded the Rainbow Coalition on May 14th, 2021, with the intent of upholding the legacy of the original Rainbow Coalition. We believe that this historic example is the model for the United Front that will best serve our class liberation. By upholding the 10-point program of the original Black Panther Party, which was subsequently adopted and later expanded by the original Young Lords, Young Patriots Organization, and all other original Rainbow Coalition members, we established our programmatic unity. The six disciplinary rules that we uphold ties all organizations in our coalition to a common professional discipline. History has bestowed upon our generation a common class mission to fulfill. The representation or, I'm sorry, the representatives of the capitalist imperialist ruling class represented by the Democratic Party and Republican Party cannot liberate us. It is their class intention and interest to uphold our common class oppression. Therefore, it is only we, the oppressed masses of all ethnicities and nationalities, who must build the necessary class solidarity, class consciousness, 
organizational structures, and a united front that will ultimately liberate ourselves. This is what the Second Rainbow Coalition is committed to. This is the historic mission we intend to fulfill. Dare to struggle, dare to win. All power to the people, boots on the ground. All members of the coalition include the New African Black Panther Party, the White Panther Party, the Green Party of New Jersey, the Poor People's Army, La Mesa Nacional de Grand Berets, NASO, which is the North Alabama School for Organizers, the New Era Young Lords, and the American Indian Movement Northeast Woodland Chapter. The six disciplinary rules. Number one, members will conduct themselves in a manner to bring credit to the coalition and will treat others with respect and politeness. Number two, members will be sober when on Rainbow Coalition business and will not engage in any criminal activity while a member. Number three, no member will engage in violence except in the extremity of self-defense. Number four, members will not gossip nor be divisive to the unity of the Second Rainbow Coalition. Number five, members will not act as informers nor work against the purpose of the Second Rainbow Coalition. Number six, nobody is authorized to speak for the Second Rainbow Coalition unless directly authorized to do so. And that is the statement of unity. Um, Sister Shanti, can you screen share the book? Please and thank you. And who would like to take a turn reading first? <laughs> Thank you, Shanti. I could go. <laughs> Chapter seven, the politics and culture of the Young Lords Party. The Young Lords, the Young Lords' headline grabbing campaigns staged so theatrically at the church elevated the organization's profile to new heights. Yet along with their newfound star power, the Young Lords were now confronted with the challenge of hundreds of young people descending on their East Harlem office clamoring to join the popular revolutionaries with the Purple Berets. In the aftermath of the church offensive, George Jose Iglesias reported that the quote, rush thereafter by young Puerto Ricans to join the Lords, who will also accept non-Puerto Rican blacks from the barrio, was so great that the organization has had to close its roles temporarily. By, by, by May 1970, the group had absorbed approximately 600 new members and thousands of friends of the Lords and Lords in training. It was less than a year since the young Lords had set out to build a vanguard revolutionary party of people of color. Organized in a paramilitary style structure, the party's charge was to agitate for reforms in the here and now, raise revolutionary consciousness and discipline the organization for the event of larger social struggles. They were guided by older political theories and also by the writings that emerged out of what came to be known as third world revolutions for independence in Algeria, Vietnam, Cuba, Congo, and beyond. These movements and others in the former colonial world were influenced in various degrees by Marxist ideas. At the same time, such movements had to define themselves in relation to less radical, quote, bourgeois nationalists Currents. The theme that had that all addressed was opposition to European imperialism and the racist ideology that justified it. The young lords identified political education as a central task. Beginning in February of 1970, the organization's central committee implemented a systematic training program for its rank and file on the history of the Puerto Rican independence movement and its lessons as well as on the theories and practices of the Marxist tradition. To disseminate their ideas within the community and beyond, the Young Lords circulated their 13-point program and platform and their newspaper, Bailante, distributed in, mimeogra in mimeographed form in the fall of 1969. The paper was transformed after the church offensive. The group also launched a radio show 
Balante on Pacifica Radio's WBAI. New York City's post-war structural and dem demographic changes fueled the organization's decision to make community organizing rather than workplace organizing its focal point. The politics and community-based organizing of the young lords together with those of other 1960s radicals of color had reconfigured the racial composition of the US socialist left. The young lords adaptation of third world revolutionary politics and rhetoric to the US urban context created a culture of resistance with iconic power. The style and charisma associated with the young lords made socialist organizations attractive to thousands of young people of color in America's slums. This was the first time in the United States that influential socialist organizations were launched, led, and built from the bottom up by young, poor, and working class people of color. New recruits. The weeks and months followed the church offensive tested the young lord's mettle. Fame and notoriety brought new opportunities and changes. The leadership worked to the brink of exhaustion to balance them. An exponential increase in inquiries and in-person requests want the young board's office. The police were interested in the going-ons too. Since the end of the church offensive, a police car had been permanently parked outside and visible from the ground floor office window. Members were abuzz with tired excitement and nervous tension. Amid these changes, the young lords had to leave the comfort and intimacy of their small cohort and the informality that their closeness fostered to make room for an incoming wave of members on whom the future of the organization depended. Becoming a young lord had never been an open process, but had not been uh, systematized as well. The large influx of recruits compelled the organization to dust off its pre-existing system for vetting and integrating new members. An interested individual would first become a quote, friend of the Lord's and then undergo a six week trial period as a Lord in training or LIT, a method that the Panthers had borrowed from the Nation of Islam. According to Richie Perez, the LIT process was about flagging potential government spies and testing a person's commitment, quote, you couldn't really be in this if you didn't believe in this. It was a lot of hard work. The breakfast program was often the litmus test for determining a recruit's grit. And LIT had to quote, get up early in the morning, gather up the kids, take them to the place, feed them breakfast, take them to school, and in between try to give them some political education. And then those of us who had jobs go to our own jobs, work our own jobs, come back after that to sell newspapers in the afternoon and go to political education class, classes at night, every day. Graduation from LIT status was not always smooth and not, not assumed. Leadership gave second chances to LITs with potential who, for personal reasons, did not complete the training. Just as important was the discipline and mentorship of the, pro, of the person in charge of the ministry to which a recruit was assigned. Over the life of the organization, much depended on, quote, who was your supervisor and how diligent they were in moving people forward and how much an individual pushed. And sometimes there was an aridia on both sides. Recruits who passed LAP training became, quote, cadre, an active, committed, and disciplined cohort of like-minded revolutionaries. Per the Revolutionary Party tradition, the cadre was trained to assess political conditions, implement a suitable practice of struggle, and build the organization. In the Young Lords, a distinction was made between leadership and cadre. Promotion involved moving through the ranks of lieutenant, captain, deputy minister, and minister. New Young Lords were funneled into a complex organizational terrain. They faced a daunting task learning how to relate to the world in an entirely new way. Like many other 1960s radicals, the young lords lived communally, a signature element of the new left's cultural imprint on its generation. 
The post-war expansion of the university have produced forms of collective living amongst proverbially poor college students enjoying life away from home. Among the politically active, it became a deliberate experiment that prefigured the new communally organized society that, rate, that radicals believed they would one day realize. It also challenged the new forms of social organization produced by post-war suburb suburbanization, private home ownership, and the nuclear family, which movement youth rejected as raceful and oppressive. It is. The arrangement was also expedient. It facilitated a lifestyle that helped sustain the exigencies of movement organization. Most young lords were full-time members who dedicated all of their time to the organization, but that alone hardly conveyed the all-consuming nature of the commitment. The first item in the young lord's rule of discipline read, quote, you are a young lord 25 hours a day. In other words, being a young lord was a way of life filled as much with meaning and purpose as with nonstop activity and exhaustion. The work of the organization encompassed a vast array of mandatory routine responsibilities, selling the group's newspaper and distributing other literature, writing for the paper and helping in its production, testing toward a door for tuberculosis and lead poisoning, setting up breakfast programs and drug detoxification work, working double time during an organization's various offenses, offensives and participating in internal political education meetings and ones organized for the community, including outdoor film screenings, which were often projected on the wall of the building. Physical fitness was mandatory given the group's paramilitary style structure. It was intended to prepare the young lords to defend themselves against police aggression as seen at the first Spanish United Methodist Church. On a regular basis, members responded to community calls for translators and assistance at local police stations, schools and welfare offices. They, they also responded to requests from schools for speakers and from organizers to send contingents to demonstrations and to lend security to the movement. The Young Lord's dizzying productivity would not have been possible if the U.S. economy had not been strong. Even though a crisis was on the horizon in the late 1960s, American capitalism was riding the last waves of its golden age. Most Americans still enjoyed high purchasing power and relatively high minimum wages, which in 1969 peaked at what would be the equivalent of $10.39 in 2015 dollars. Combined, these conditions made full-time organizing affordable. Radicalized youth seized the opportunity to pour their energies into their goal of changing the world on, flare, on fairly small stipends of $60 a week. Most young lords lived frugally. They survived on the funds they collected from the sale of the organization's newspaper, half of which they kept for themselves. Some young lords still lived with their parents and thus had minimal expenses. Few held full-time jobs. In accordance with the organization's rule, those who worked full-time contributed more than half of their salary to the organization and then went on to organize at night when they got home from work. When necessary, the organization subsidized room and board. It set up a mess hall in a large apartment in a building it acquired sometime in 1970 at 75 East 110th Street. Members ate meals there for free at a long dinner table in shifts of 20 at a time. One of the group's chief cooks, Vietnam veteran and young Lord Julio Rodan, maximized his talents on behalf of the organization. The new recruits, quote, considerably improved the diet and reduced the cost of feeding full-time workers in the organization. Guerrilla style Leninist form. Other forces contributed to the organization's unusual output. The young lords demanded a high level of participation and commitment from its members. The young lords were building a revolutionary party an assignment that 2 million students declared important during a national poll in 1969. Success will require overcoming racism 
and ethnic divides within the working class and the political influence of multiple anti-communist scares in the 20th century. But by the mid-1960s, guerrillas had defeated or were defeating imperial powers from Cuba to Algeria and Vietnam. These wars and revolutions against colonial rule were raising the possibility that third world people might succeed at reorganizing society on a global scale. In the theater of war, the Tet Offensive symbol symbolic victory proved that the United States could be defeated by what President Johnson called, quote, a raggedy ass little third weight country. The Tet Offensive also broadened the mutinous disposition of an ever growing sector of US soldiers. At home, the era's widespread political crises have eroded go government authority and legitimacy. The body count among US soldiers fueled opposition to the war and compelled young people to learn about US foreign policy and the activities of the Central Intelligence Agency, or what we know as CIA, that are overthrown governments and trained counterinsurgency forces to suppress popular movements abroad. At home, the rebellions that swept through the cities like a hurricane exposed the entrenched character of racial and economic inequality served as stark reminder of the limits of civil rights reform and made clear to many that nothing of a short radical reorganization of society would bring about an equitable social form, order. A new wave of protests after 1968, like the deadly protests at Kent and Jackson State Universities against the US invasion of Cambodia, brought an expansion of state repression Campaigns of criminalization, incarceration, and homicidal violence by local police and Conto Pro, or what we know as neutralization, especially against known move leaders of color, sowed deep indignation and incubated among ever growing numbers of people. More radical critiques of society. For the young lords, the frame up of the New York Panther 21 the assassination of Fred Hampton, the persecution of Chacha Jimenez, and the surveillance and imprisonment of Puerto Rican radicals such as Juan Sartre, Carlos Feliciano, and Pancho Cruz were dramatic examples of state repression close to home. The U.S. government's increasing reliance on, quote, armed bodies of men, the open use of force to maintain social control was a sign that dominant ideology had ceased to be effective as the preferred manager of social tensions in an unequal society. According to Richie Perez, quote, the repression that was unleashed against the people seemed to be so vicious that it was the domestic equivalent of the massacres of Vietnam. And the era's multiple assassinations of national figures such as John F. Kennedy, Malcolm X, Martin Luther King Jr., and Robert Kennedy seemed symptomatic of an irreparably sick society. Among individual radicals and many others in the United States, the era's tragedies generated a moral dilemma. Amid a crisis of legitimacy and erosion of public trust in government, domestic origin organizers wrestled with questions of commitment and sacrifice for a greater good. Malcolm X had captured the sentiment with this distinctively, with this distinctive clarity when he said, quote, if you're not willing to die for it, the word freedom, put the word freedom out of your vocabulary. Young Lord Richie Perez put it differently. Vietnam and the civil rights movement and black power had raised issues, the issue of moral choices. The idea that you could be a good Nazi without being in the Nazi party, that you could be complicit with the war without actually dropping the bombs, and that you could be complicit with institutionalized racism without calling someone a nigger. Those were heavy things. Armed with the evangelical co commitment and earnest passion of their youth, the founders of the organization built a full-time membership directed 
in its political perspective and organizing activities by a range of Marxist, Leninist, and Guevaraist theories, explaining the nature of society, the roots of exploitation and oppression under capitalism, and how to bring about revolutionary change. They distinguish their own liberatory position on the right to armed self-defense, especially among racialized people in the United States from systemic violence. As Juan Gonzalez explained to a Dutch reporter, we believe in armed self-defense, not because we like violence. No one likes violence, but you have to make a differentiation between the open and direct violence that very often is wrongfully attributed to revolutionaries and the type of violence that is perpetuated on a regular basis against poor people. Whether it's the violence of having to go all winter in an apartment that has no heat or the violence of having to go to a hospital that doesn't give you services and you end up dying. You don't die with a bullet necessarily, but you die in different ways. <clears throat> The Young Lords adopted the appearance and style of the era's most iconic freedom fighter, fighters, the guerrillas of the Cuban Revolution, but they were not guerrilla combatants deploying armed raids against sites of government power. As Denise Oliver explained, they also did not, quote, place or throw bombs in the names of Puerto Rican independence, a strategy the Young Lords announced as, quote, severely misguided. Like those of the Black Panthers, the day-to-day -day activities of the young boards consisted of political education, propaganda, and agitation. Within the socialist tradition, these tools and tactics are also closely associated with the ideas of V.I. Lenin, the leader of the 1917 Russian Revolution, on the necessity of revolutionary party in the protracted battle against capitalism. Based on decades of experience steering the Bolsheviks through the years of prece years preceding the Russian Revolution, he theorized about the role and function of the Revolutionary Party. Lenin viewed the party as the, quote, vanguard of the class, a subsection of the working class, whose outlook reflects the class's highest e economic and political interests. Its aim was to prepare its members to interpret social developments, identify peak moments of political crisis, amplify revolutionary propaganda, and transform the spontaneity of mass uprisings into revolution through the seizure of state power. The party's cadre trained for these movements through its engagement in interim struggles, developing disciplined routine activities and winning trust within the class as the tribune of the oppressed. The Young Lord's Minister of Information, Pablo Guzman, recounts having to adjust prospective members' misperceptions of the group's mission. Quote, we found that a lot of people thought we were just, that we were there just to throw garbage in the street. They couldn't understand that we were really there for a socialist revolution. We were really there to off the government of the United States. They just couldn't deal with that. So we tried setting up political education classes. In 1970, only a few Black Panthers and a handful of young lords read Lenin. In the main, the young lords Maoist orientation concealed the Leninist roots of many of its organizational practices, such as the emphasis on the newspaper. However, like most of the new left, the young lords exposure to Lenin was reflected through the figures like Mao, Joseph Stalin, Ho Chi Minh, Fidel Castro, and Che Guevara. Most of these figures identified the peasantry, small groups of students, radical intellectuals, and peasant guerrilla armies as the agents of revolution. This political current also emphasizes the power of will, the commitment and self-sacrifice in the revolutionary process. By contrast, Lenin and classical Marxists emphasized the working class as the primary agent of revolutionary change and the party's social base. For them, socialist revolution depends on a combination of favorable objective conditions, including a crisis of legitimacy within the system combined with revolutionary consciousness 
and political leadership within the working class, the young lords leaned heavily toward the Maoist orientation, especially in its later years. The leadership of the young lords brought a range of different views to the organization. Pablo Guzman and Denise Oliver, for example, were attracted to the left wing of the Black Freedom Movement, in part for its attention to class differences within New Africans, and believed that the young lords should pursue the strongest possible connections with the Black Panther Party, which emphasized organizing the poorest sections of the new African community. Oliver's brief studies at Howard University have put her in dialogue with a cohort of West Indian students who became influential in the Black Power movement, including Alfred Bobbington Johnson and Hubert Brown, later H. Rap Brown. The experience emboldened her revolutionary Black nationalist views, and she came to the organization while versed in its debates. Felipe Luciano, on the other hand, who developed his oratorical skills in the world of the arts and worked under the tutelage of the Black cultural nationalist Amiri Baraka, cautioned against the idea of turning the young lords into a replica of the Black Panthers. He believed that because Puerto Rican culture and national identity reflected a specific experience of migration from and colonization of Puerto Rico, a radical reclamation of Puerto Rican culture would be among the most powerful galvanizing forces in El Barrio. Luciano's cultural orientation found support in David Perez's perspective, which according to Juan Gonzalez, quote, was more grounded in common sense. Perez defined his political condition based on, quote, what ordinary Puerto Ricans might think about a given problem. Gonzalez, for his part, began reading Marxism in the summer of 1968 following his expulsion from Colombia. He was also influenced by his partner, Gloria Fontanas, health captain of the Young Lords, who had a strong sense of the power and place of workers and socialists and social movements, and also advocated a closer relationship to the Puerto Rican nationalist movement. Although leadership made some decisions as Leninist, the Lords practiced democratic centralism, a process wherein policies and political direction are discussed and debated by cadre, decided by majority vote and adhered to strictly. In the first year, leadership fostered a tolerant and open political culture, bridged differences and worked together effectively. Quote, staying together was both priority and prize. Even so, according to Juan Gonzalez, the group's quote, internal political battles were intense we had very long meetings that were draining. Do we stop here? I was actually just looking at the schedule. Um, now we read this section two. The section that we'll be stopping at is where it says embody revolutionary nationalist ideas in the 1960s. Okay, okay, right here, all right. <clears throat> educating a new generation of radicals. The young lords put education at the center of their broad vision of liberation. Like the Black Panthers, they took education into their own hands and redefined it. The group's internal edification regimen, which they called PE for a political education, required members to take seriously the study of history and radical political theory. It included regularly scheduled reading hours and group discussion, a form of peer-to-peer -peer learning that the Bronx education advocate Evelina Antonetti observed among the young lords and began to promote in Bronx public schools. The political development of new recruits also depended on a strong rubric for learning social theory, FAST. Two of the group's most disciplined and talented leaders Juan Gonzalez and Iris Morales developed a method and process for integrating and training new members in a new layer of leaders. <clears throat> According to Guzman, Gonzalez, quote, knew the most. He had the clearest mind. Morales was sharp. She was able to absorb the ideas and break them down so that anyone could understand them. 
acting as minister and deputy minister of education, respectively, in early 1970, Gonzalez and Morales launched a 13-week course whose topic, topics and readings connected to each point of the Lord's 13-point program and platform. For many Puerto Ricans, education had been fraught with the trauma and social rejection they endured as children in New York public schools. The sense that it was meaningless had led many members of the organization to drop out of school. <coughs> But under the tutelage of the young lords, hundreds of young people, some of whom could barely read and write when they joined, were receiving a college-like education, transforming them into impressive autodidacts. The undertaking was not without its difficulties, however. Writing during the time, Minister of Education Pablo Guzman quipped about the readings they assigned, and nobody could read the books. And then, those who could read, let's say something like Che on Man and Socialism, threw the book away and said, quote, this is boring. Juan could not understand how Che Guevara could be boring. You know, it blew his mind, but the young lords persisted. Guzman continues, we tried everything, man, from jokes to getting high together, everything to try to bring the point across. The organization became a formidable school in and of itself and more. It became a fount of newfound freedom in the lives of new members during their late teens and 20s, a phase of life when, transi when transition brings on crises of confidence and identity. Like other radicals before them, the young lords spent countless hours analyzing class subjugation and domination in, so in society at large. But 1960s radicals added a new dimension of, to social criticism. As illustrated in the, in, the, in the Poco women's movement slogan, the personal is political. Radicals also studied the imprint of larger social and political forces on their own lives and sense of themselves. In doing so, the movements expanded the meaning of freedom and liberation for their generation to include the personal. To the young lords, deconstruction of custom and ideology was central to the process of liberation. It was a signature of their movement. Through collective analyses of shared experiences, they illuminated the dehumanizing nature of oppression within their community. This process is best captured in the 1971 oral history and photography book project, Bailante, the Young Lords Party. In it, members tackled the fallout of being either demeaned for speaking Spanish or tokenized in school tracking programs. They bear witness to anti-Black racism amongst Puerto Ricans and other Latinx, the patriarchal roots of, disconnect, of, discon, of discontent in modern family life, dehumanization suffered by parents in factories, psychic impotency and powerlessness on which structures of inequality depend which they call, quote, colonized mentality, and internalized anger produced by powerlessness. Their ultimate goal, however, was to help a generation gain understanding of the structural causes of alienation and suffering. To that end, they developed a method and process for training members politically. In their words, quote, the young birds were an initiation for a whole generation of people into their culture and their history. All of a sudden, I knew why my mother was angry, why my father was angry, and why I, know, why I no longer could blame them for anything. All of a sudden, I knew that they were victims in the big show because we were Puerto Rican and we were living here and we understood the beauty and the ugliness, but the young lords came to explain why. <coughs> Even the group's most experienced members often transcended their socially imposed fears through radical education and engagement. As the leadership of the young lords came of age, many felt alienated in discussions of the social theories that were increasingly popular in movement circles. Iris Morales, deputy, of, deputy minister of education, explained the process by which she was drawn to revolutionary ideas, quote, as I started to get politically involved, I was struck by the absence of Latinos, and that the white activists use a language that I really didn't understand. 
but I listened because I said, I'll pick it up along the way. I remember feeling that there was something, some language, not a private code, but it was some level of understanding that I knew I didn't have. Minister of Education Guan Gonzalez also remembers his early relationship to the theories that he was now intent on disseminating among new recruits. Quote, I felt I needed to read some Marxism because I really felt totally ill-equipped even to engage in discussions with white SDS or students from a democratic society members because I didn't have any kind of grounding. The deficit observed by these leaders was a consequence of several external developments. From the time of their first settlements in New York at the turn of the century, Puerto Rican weekends have formed part of an array of political fraternal orders and labor and socialist organizations. During the 1930s, they were active in New York's vibrant trade union movement and thousands joined the Communist Party or its affiliates. But with the advent of the Cold War, the pall of silence and secrecy forced on the old left by the Red Scare at home also disemboweled the Puerto Rican left. In 1948, at the start of the Red Scare, the U.S. government orchestrated the passage in Puerto Rico of the gag law, known in Spanish as Le de la Modasa. As its name suggests, the law had a chilling effect on the free exchange and political ideas that reached deep into the culture of Puerto Ricans on the island and in the continental United States. It banned the Puerto Rican flag, the Nationalist Party of Puerto Rico, writings about, uh, writings about and gatherings to discuss uh, independence and references to independences, independence movement in music. The decree unleashed fear and a clear message that endorsing ideas associated with Puerto Rican freedom will come at a heavy personal cost. Enforced for a decade until 1957 and ensured the incarceration of key nationalist leaders, pushed, under, push, pushed others underground and weakened the organizations that might have passed on to the younger generation their analysis of social problems. <clears throat> Stranded strands of the Puerto Rican left remained politically engaged underground on the island and the mainland, but disconnected from the grassroots, they were mostly reduced to small erudite circles with a disproportionately white middle-class membership unfit to mentor a group like the Young Lords, which many viewed as the riffraff. Within the continental United States, the Red Scare marginalized and demonized the left and shrouded much of theory and mystery and obscurity. It drastically, it, it drastically limited exposure to Marxism and other radical theories of social, uh, social change. When left politics became popular again in the 1960s with the political radicalization of the movement, knowledge of Marxism became the dominant, became the domain of white, of young white activists on college campuses, an intellectual avant-garde that disconnected from the working class, sometimes adopted airs of middle-class superiority and white paternalism. The expression of white supremacy in a movement that became known for making racism unpopular was bad enough, but it reflected a larger presence in and dimension of the, of the broader society that were not interrogated. To the young boards and others who shared their worldview, this reality confirmed the significance of, quote, the national question. The call used idiosyncratically among radically oppressed, racially oppressed people to build separate race-based political organizations as a necessary challenge to racism and its fallout. For emerging working, cl working class radicals of color, such as Morales, Gonzalez, and others, the Young Lords did just that. Gonzalez was one of the organization's strongest theoreticians, as was Denise Oliver, whose parents formed part of New York's vibrant Black left culture during the 1940s and were friendly travelers of the Communist Party. Oliver had a, quote, understanding of the unions, knew who Lenin was, and read some of that, and had a fairly grounded set of politics, theoretically. By offering an alternative, unpretentious, training ground where revolutionary ideas were accessible to working class people in communities of color, 
the young lord's political education proved personally meaningful and politically transformative to new members and for the children of migrants whose experience in the streets and the schools made them feel unfit and outside of mainstream u.s society the study of history and political theory in the young lords was a powerful antidote to class anxieties and feelings of intellectual inadequacy the young lords found other founts of Marxist politics and hope of influencing and perhaps winning the young lords over to their traditions. Members of the Communist Party's Black Caucus, the Chela Mumba Club, took up that assignment. Deacon Alexander and Charlene Mitchell of the Chela Mumba Club held political education sessions with the lords and their central committee. Others passed on the revolutionary tradition too, including Claudia Jones, Ella Baker, James Baldwin, Evelina Antonetti, Gilberto, Joanna Valentin, Juan Antonio Correa, and James and Grace Lee Boggs. Awesome. Thank you, Sister Shanti. Of course. You did a beautiful job reading. You always do. <laughs> I try. <laughs> You got a good voice for that. You could legit like get one of those jobs to read books for like the, the audiobooks programs and stuff. <laughs> I was I was thinking about that too. Don't worry. It's coming it's, it's coming soon. It will come eventually. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> I will not be surprised when it happens. <laughs> I will snag up some of your audiobooks. <laughs> My pleasure. <laughs> chapter in this book, really diving into things. Um, I'm curious uh, what all thoughts you guys have on this chapter. The floor is open. <laughs> Comrade Joe, I see you got your hand up. Yeah, one of the things that I liked what in, in part of this reading was uh, uh, when Gonzalez was mentioning that they were they were following some of their early family members from the 40s that were part of the Communist Party. Um, unlike probably most of us, uh, my family have never been uh, involved in, in, in anything with Marxism or Leninism or, or Communism or Maoism or any type of ism. Uh, I clearly recall, like my dad called me a communist, like I think it's starting like at the age of nine or ten or something. You're a communist. You got a communist way of thinking. Like, who who would have known that um, after growing up and stuff like that, that uh, communism intrigues me. That's all. But uh, all the history we bring up and, and the young Lord tie in and the history is very similar to uh, those of uh, Brown Berets and. And, and and I and I like the similarity uh, because we're all we're all fighting the oppressors and we're all fighting for liberation and uh, I I'm just I'm really grateful we have this. Thank you, Sister Shanti. Thank you, Sister Shanti. Thank you, Sister Shanti. I'm, I'm curious, what are your thoughts as one of our elders and advisors? Well, um, I, I know I know that I, I really am, when I'm able to get on the calls and things like that, I learn a, learn a lot. This, this writing is particularly clear. Um, the one thing I, that I know from my experience with uh, the movement and stuff like that is that... Uh, there was this this whole notion of the the CP being a, a leader. They they were a leader as an organization, but then there was a period during that Red Scare when they uh, really betrayed the movement, and particularly they betrayed the uh, people of color that were in the uh, CP. They're not maybe maybe not maybe the most prestigious names, not the big names, 
Uh, but but the, the rank and file uh, people who were in the Communist Party were betrayed because the what the CP did under the conditions of the McCarthy era was to liquidate the party. It was like uh, you have to have when you're building organization, you have to have a contingency plan for when uh, the shit hits the fan. And that's that's the problem uh, with with a, with a, this notion that it's just going to be uh, allowed to continue. It's going to be legally protected by bourgeois democracy. That that was the kind of the bargain that the CP thought they had with the Roosevelt coalition. And so they they basically uh, folded their membership into the Democratic Party in many, many respects, or the progressive wing of the Democratic Party in 1948. Uh, you know, they were running uh, this guy Wallace, big progressive, and the CP was all all in every single aspect of the trade union movement and all the all the electoral work that was going on, they thought they were covered by the, you know, the big umbrella of demo bourgeois democracy, and that they wouldn't be attacked. But then they, they were attacked subsequently after World War II, and they didn't have a way to go underground. They didn't have a way to continue to organize. So they abandoned literally hundreds of thousands of people who were devoted to the movement. And so <clears throat> when I see the, the names of the the uh, leaders who continued to do some work, you know, uh, the uh, Ella Baker and uh, Claudia Jones and other, other people who were more prestigious uh, Black members of the CP, I always remember that a lot of the, the working class people who were not leaders per se, but they were cadre, they were active, they were in the communities, they were abandoned wholesale. And, um, you know, we're still paying for that in many respects. In many respects, the origins of the, I mean, the history of why, why the Black Panthers emerged was partly due to the inadequacies of the organizations that were left after the McCarthy scare. You know, you had, like, uh, if you read Aaron Dixon's book, he talks about his dad being, a, a, you know, at least a fellow traveler of the CP, but probably in the CP was a trusted to uh, be a, like a bodyguard for Paul Robeson and things like that. And Yet Aaron didn't feel like compelled to join the CP because the CP wasn't really reflecting uh, by the 1960s. They weren't reflecting anything revolutionary so that the young people had to form new organizations. Uh, and it, it came out of that spontaneous anti-war movement, out of the student movement, out of the civil rights movement. And those new organizations uh, were were uh, su were somewhat suffered from the fact that they didn't have the continuity to the to the Communist Party that led the labor movement in the 1930s. They had to start almost from scratch to piece together, you know, what had had been a body of work and a body of knowledge. So I think, and in many ways, I think we're still suffering from that. I was, I was, I feel fortunate to have been mentored by uh, people who were uh, experienced from the thirties, from the, from World War II, from even from, you know, the, 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 the battle for Spain, you know, the Spanish American Civil or Spanish Civil War, nineteen thirty six. So I knew people who who had that kind of uh, legacy and that kind of depth, and they were 
they were uh, Bolsheviks. Some of them were s s really, really uh, grounded in, in Marxism, Leninism, and uh, and and you know they were they were also the ones that I knew were also uh, adherents of Mao Zedong. You know they just were not they were not the same uh, caliber as a, as a young person in the new left. They were they were different. They came from a different era, but uh, I, I think it was a great tragedy uh, that the, that uh, there was that we lost some of the continuity. But um, you know, I think it's inevitable when you rely on bourgeois democracy instead of uh, revolutionary activity and education. Um, then you're going to build the wrong kind of organization. <laughs> you're going to have something that you know, uh, you know, dependent for its very existence on bourgeois democracy. And that's what a lot of people are trying to do today. They're talking progressive this, a progressive that. And Ber oh, Bernie sold us out. But Bernie always was going to sell you out. You know, I mean, like, what, how many times will we be fooled? So I, this is a very instructive uh, um, book. And, you know, you can just you can you can come away from it with a great admiration for these young her heroes, but you can also got to come away with it with a real sober estimation of where we are today, and we're 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 a long way from where we got to be. But the the thing I will say finally, and I'll shut up. You asked, don't forget you asked. But um, the the final thing I'll say is. You can talk to anybody today. I have conversations about the, the state of affairs with Uber drivers, people on the bus. Yeah, I mean, it's wide open right now. I mean, the people are so abandoned. The people are so upset. I mean, you go to I go to T-Mobile, get a, get a crappy phone, um, and all those kids are going to get laid off. You know, the, the, they announced that 5,000 are going to be laid off. They're all working part time anyway, so it's like there's no real future for the youth of this country. And if anybody's going to do something, they're going to have to address uh, these young people and their hopes and dreams, and they're going to have to do it, you know, on their on the, on terms that the young people um, can can learn from them. But but um, w the last thing in the world we need right now is like to be the big head on these situations. We need to unite with the people and then and then bring them up to speed about what's really happening to them. They're being abandoned they're, and their their future is is uh is nothing. Absolutely nothing. You're in on so many fucking accounts there. <laughs> it's one of those things that yeah. you can still see happening to a certain extent to the CCP here. It's, uh, like, even when they run their own uh, campaigns for candidates and stuff, too, when it doesn't pan out, they throw their support behind whoever the Democrat candidates are. Um, same for DSA, which was just like a bastardized fucking communist party light that is <laughs> yeah. in Democrat party. Um, exactly. just, you know, <laughs> it, hmm. it's all fucked. Um, and it also, uh, what, what you were mentioning about um, what happened with them back in the 40s, like this, this goes back even a little bit further and brings in another facet here where, okay, like with with older socialist movements that were going on here in the building of unions to try to, you know, get workers in the position where they could actually seize the means of production. Um, part of that red scare with McCarthyism was to um, shut down unions capacity to give just enough of the demands the unions were making to make people feel a little complacent and go, okay, well, we got the majority of what we wanted, so we can shut up and go back to work now. Um, and every time it was always significantly less than what the unions actually wanted and needed to achieve. 
but that's also how they liberalized the unions out of being radical communist movements that you know had that goal in mind of actually seizing the means of fucking production to have collective ownership over the places where they worked and, and got people complacent with being in that position of being employee and constantly having to ask the oppressor master may i please have some more crumbs um and at the same time uh, as those unions were doing that shit back then in like the 30s and 40s, they also, just like the CCP, they went and neglected everybody who had any pigment who was in the unions. They neglected black workers. They neglected brown workers. They uh, oftentimes fucking refused to allow them membership in the unions, which is really fucked because the people who were initially starting those movements like Eugene V. Debs were not about that shit. They were about uniting all the workers regardless of your ethnicity and background of like, no, we have a class struggle to fight here. And because of the Red Scare shit that then came later uh, with McCarthy, they participated in that same fucking bullshit and left all of the black and brown workers hanging where they had no options to protect themselves with the union because they weren't being allowed to participate in the union. And so when the unions were striking and whatnot, the fucking companies would go and seek out black and brown workers. Like, hey, will you, will you come be a stab and cross the picket line for us in order to, you know, keep some food on your own fucking plate? And when everybody was going through economic hardship at the time, Who's going to turn down work? And especially going against a union that already fucked them. They were like, fuck, we'll take the work. And then they got a whole bunch of backlash from the unions and racist bullshit. Sister Zen, you're cutting in and out. Uh, I think your phone might be overheating. Skip. My apologies, I still got it on the ice pack, but, uh, you know, it, it's doing what it can. <laughs> but uh, I don't know, I hope you guys caught most of that. It was a little bit of history behind that, that pattern, not just being in the Communist Party, but in the unions and stuff then too. And it's a lot of shit that we're still dealing with the ramifications from. That's all. Well said, uh, comrade sister, uh, Zen and uh, Andy. Appreciate you bringing us uh, our, our bring, bringing a more clear understanding of uh, um, the CP. Uh, so I, I, I really appreciate that. And I know we have a couple other people here, um, comrades. Here um, is anybody else have any input on to today's chapter um, that they would like to share or. Comrade Andy, if you had anything to, to respond to Comrade Trish, because I know she's having a little technical difficulties there. Anyone? Why, well, I, I would say that I back her up 100% on the union thing. Um, I was in the machinist union in the early 70s, uh, a real a mixed shop of every nationality in, in Oakland, California. And we had uh, um, we had some radicals in the shops uh, that would go to the union meetings. I was one. Most of the time, nobody went to the union meetings. But the, the, if people look now back, it's hard to believe. But I saw a guy get thrown out of a general meeting for bringing up the support of immigrant workers. That was in the machinist union in California. And uh, the unions were bribed. That's all That's all you can say. They were bought and paid for. The uh, they, they, under George Meany and all the, all the union leaders of the, Walter Ruther, all of them, they, they kept their mouth shut about imperialism and allowed attacks to go on on the people of Latin America, Africa, all around the world, Southeast Asia. The unions uh, uh, largely supported the Vietnam War. 
you know, anti-communist to the bone. And they did the dirty work of the capitalist class in many respects. Uh, I knew guys in the uh, Teamsters for Democracy in the late 70s. Uh, they got beat by the, by the mob inside their own union. So the unions, like I have an old Puerto Rican friend, and he says, uh, uh, well, it's, it's uh, only one system. There's a, there's a two-headed snake at the, at the top, a Democratic and Republican Party. And I said, yeah, and what about the unions? He said, yeah, yeah, actually, it's a three-headed snake. So <laughs> it's like the, they, they're, they're not to be trusted because they are uh, largely bought and paid for. So uh, union, I believe in union work, and I have friends who are uh, union members and and communists, and, and I think it's an important field. But you can't. One thing you have to do when you're doing union work, you can't delude yourself. You can't talk yourself into believing that the union leadership is going to uh, let you uh, go on. Yeah, they won't. I have I have had union leaders tell me this, and I almost verbatim. It was this in West Virginia. I was organizing in the chemical industry, and they said, "Well, you know, uh, back in the '40s, what they're talking about West Virginia now." He said, "There was a lot of communists. There was they were, they did really good work. They organized. They built the union, and then we had to throw them out." That's that's what he said. I mean, uh, and the unions betrayed the working class. They betrayed the the movement. Uh, so whatever they did do, uh, you have to always look and say, well, okay, they marched with the civil rights movement. Okay, yeah, that's cool, but. Uh, what else, you know, the other side of the coin, what else were they doing? They were they were systematically uh, selling it out and cre allowing for two-tiered wage systems to go on where the, the black worker could be paid less and be at a lower level of union membership or whatever the hell. You know, they've, they've schemed and dealt, dealt dirty deals uh, and you know, they they let when I was working in the in the plants. I mean, there was the there was clan members in the plants, and the union didn't have a big problem with that. But you know, if it got out you were a communist, you can bet you were going to get problems. You know, and my my uh, my wife and I both were confronted numerous times, you know, about our political beliefs and attacked and threatened, including death threats. So I I believe in unions, but I don't uh, trust the union leadership in the United States at all. And nobody should. You know, I, I, one of the things you brought up earlier, too, is... Uh in the McCarthy years, um, would you like to uh, uh, touch up a little bit more on, on uh, uh, you know, within the respect that you're a little bit older and, uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, no, my, my parents now watch it now. McCarthy years, but uh, would you like to elaborate on that for some of us that are well, uh, uh, in our fifties, yeah, forties, and thirties? I, 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 yeah, I'm, you're, you're not. I was only a little kid, you know, but. Uh, so it didn't actually affect me or my family very much. We didn't didn't notice it too much. It was like, but like the McCarthy era was like a, a clamp down on on all trade unionism, but also on particularly on the communist tr uh, trade unionism. So that they they negotiated deals with the unions that excluded the communist influence that was that was the the bare bones of it 
that the that there was true that the communists did build the unions. You know, every single one of the unions, the the coal miners union, the steel workers union, the auto workers union, the particularly the longshore union out west. Uh, but you th- you think of a union uh, movement, and it was pretty much led by the communists during the thirties. Um, uh, there was a great movie made in uh, Mexico around about silver mines and stuff like that. It was it, uh, what the hell is the name? Uh, I can't remember the name. I know it's it's really great, but it's about the union movement that went on there, and it was viciously suppressed. Most most people identified with the unions because they were they uh, were they were, by being led by communists they were actually fighting unions in the 30s so that they 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 didn't uh take no crap you know they were they went up against anybody who came at them so there was that but the mccarthy era a result of the deal that was struck with roosevelt just prior to the end of World War II, and that 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 av- right after World War II, there were some strikes. Like there was a coal mining strike, and John L. Lewis was the head of the union, and he was an anti-communist, and they they wanted those coal miners back to work. You know, so those kinds of deals were only to be had if you got rid of the communist leadership, which they systematically did but then like all the all the people who had rank and file jobs you know then they if the if russia was the enemy and these people were uh all thought of as russian spies you know because people had just come out of world war ii where there were active uh german spy rings within the united states they were blowing up factories they were doing all kinds of crap, setting fires in the Northwest. They they were uh, really vicious. So people came out of um, World War II with an attitude, well, we don't trust the Germans. We don't trust the Japanese. Uh, we don't trust the uh, Russians. They're all out to screw us. And um, so that the idea that there'd be uh, Russians trying to overthrow the United States and that there were uh, agents all with completely embedded in the United States working class who were pro-Russian, you know, that was like used as a, a way to create a witch hunt atmosphere. You know, there's there's a lot of evidence of, of how that went down. And, you know, even stuff in the you know, on TV like Rod Serling, was a particularly great writer and and uh, producer of TV shows, and he'd examine these things. But he had to he had to he had to do it kind of by self censoring himself. It's sort of like, well, you be suspicious of this neighbor, and everybody in the neighborhood starts talking about him. And pretty soon, they're dragging his ass out on the uh, street and killing him, or whatever, you know. And it was like a it was like a, a metaphor for what was happening by by creating a witch hunt atmosphere in the in the country. You know, it it went against democracy. It went against all the things that we said we were about. So there was, uh, but the the ability to crit, even openly critique what was going on was uh, uh, clobbered because they. They got rid of all the uh, left-wing writers and poets and actors. And, you know, I mean, I was just reading the other day about this guy. He was a suspected communist. He was on a real popular TV show called The Goldbergs about a Jewish family in in Tenement, New York. And they uh, not only did they fire his ass, uh, they closed the whole show down. The sponsor said, we're not sponsoring no uh, commie Jew <laughs> TV show. This was like 1952 or 51. And so everybody got fired. 
the guy who they accused of being communist was not a communist. He killed himself. It was like a, it was like a horror, horror after horror on personal level for people. And on a political level, it was keep your mouth shut. Don't say a word. And, uh, you know, that kind of thing. So um, I see that I see that coming back to us, you know, in, in many respects, we're going to be, uh, uh, you know, attacked in similar ways. You know, it's already happening on the so-called cultural wars. But but uh, we we're going to have to build a, a stronger and more uh, clear-headed defense, and we're not going to be able to say, um, you know, no, I'm, I'm, I'm not a revolutionary. I never, I never knew any revolutionary. I, I, I don't know nothing about no revolutions. You know. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, thank, thank you. Positive for that. thing. I, I was glad yeah, I you say, I am a goddamn revolutionary, you, and exactly. I have every right to be. And everybody I know pretty much would be if they weren't uh, being bullshitted by you. Yeah, and I was glad you brought up the unions and, and also uh, kind of the witch hunt they did uh, within the actors and the writers guild uh, unions at the time where they were, I mean, they were just witch hunting and targeting anyone at that time. But I seen uh, uh, Comrade Shanti and uh, Comrade Zen making some comments. Would you like to say something, if, if, if anything? Thank you. Uh, yeah, yeah, I just wanted, uh, sorry. <laughs> go ahead, Shanti. No, 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 you can go ahead, you can go ahead. Okay, um, I was just gonna say, like, it, it's absolutely fucking disturbing the way that they were able to do this PSYOP. Um, it started with, uh, I believe it was called the Office of Anti-American Activities or some shit like that, that was doing the blacklisting of, you know, actors, writers, etc. in Hollywood. And as you pointed out, mostly targeting Jewish people because there was a, a lot of Jewish people who were of communist thought and wanting to actually get back to you know living collectively and actually taking care of each other and so it was a place for anti-semitism to take root um but in turn they were able to use all of that to cause divisiveness amongst the masses and have neighbors turning on neighbors and fucking turning each other in to try to save their own skin and pointing the finger in the wrong direction and right. leading to shit like that of that poor guy fucking killing himself you know that he's not the only one that was so common because people were losing every fucking thing of their livelihood itself, their ability to fucking survive, just because somebody pointed a finger at them like, hey, this motherfucker over here thinks everybody deserves housing and food and health care. We should kill them for that. And it's like, what mm -hmm. the fuck is wrong with people allowing these types of PSYOP fucking programs to, to mind people fuck them? It, it was the roots of COINTEL Pro there with that Office of Anti-American Activities. Um, go ahead, Shanti, because I know you mm -hmm. probably got some excellent thoughts on this one too. Oh, oh, oh! I, oh, I got a lot of thoughts. I got a lot of thoughts on this, and thankfully, um, I'm 19, so we have a young um, perspective on this. Um, mm -hmm. I, I was born a year and three months after Bush Jr. Um, annihilated Iraq and so I grew up seeing the political and social dynamics of what was happening you know with every colonized person um, the concept of race was more weaponized than ever um, more class division amongst colonized peoples amongst colonized communities um, a lot of um anti-trans, anti-gay, anti-queer um, shit that was happening, especially um, in the newspapers, on TV and media. It was like a winch hunt all over again when I was growing up. And the youth back then, because these were millennials, um, they also fell into that trap too with the conditions in which they were in, you know, that were created by capitalism. And so... Um, you know, it's kind of started that plight of assimilating 
obliviously, you know, to the military complex, to all of that stuff. So I grew up around that. I grew up seeing it while not having a finger on it. And that's <coughs> one of the um one of the things that I think the Red Scare playing a big role in today right now what we see right now because mccarthyism was again was was a witch hunt and the effects of what mccarthyism entailed having those people turn against each other made possible by the u.s empire okay it was not only physical it was not only social but it was also psychological because it promoted, it also inadvertently promoted individualism. You know, the neighbors that uh, killed that one guy because, you know, they um, thought he was, you know, a communist and stuff like that. That, 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 that is what happened even when Colin Pro became, uh, became actually Colin Pro, um, especially with the uh, Puerto Rican movement with, um, uh, Don Pedro Abizu uh, Campos, of uh, the uh, president of the Puerto Rican Nationalist Party, um, you know the gang law, you know what they did to him, you know suppressing mm. uh, the Puerto Rican uh, independence movement by all means, because you know I believe this was I would have to say about fifty years after the U.S. Empire took over the island of Puerto Rican. So those um, those actions still ring here today. I mean, I see um, youth, um, my fellow young people that are obliviously being blue, you know, politically, being red politically, um, you know, advocating, you know, promoting this idea that <coughs> their oppression is you know just a systemic flaw, and you know you know go hard, it will be okay. Not understanding that they were that they're being trained to be fascist, having no idea at mm. all, and I think that's what uh, affected us is because we do not have that kind of resource or that kind of um, uh, that system of accountability of critique of self critique of pulling back into reality, because once again, this is not reality, but that's the point. Um, you know, becoming part of these democratic factions, being part of these Republican factions, you know, they're, I mean, we all know they're the same people, um, you know, you know, obliviously annihilating their destiny. And they have no idea, especially um, with youth that are from um, like petty bougie backgrounds or middle class backgrounds <clears throat> from uh, rich, uh, more richer um, economic, socioeconomic backgrounds um, because this is a class struggle, of course. Um, that kind of uh, upbringing also plays a big role into you know, them being part of these factions and from heavily, you know, promoting these ideas, you know, not understanding that they would be next to, um, you know, because, you know, as we see right now, it's a, it's a full-blown witch hunt against everyone and it's no turning back. Like, I mean, I mean, it, I mean, there were signs since the beginning of COVID and um, I mean, we, I mean, we had our foot down for a while, but eventually they, you know, after <clears throat> the uprisings, um, after George Floyd's genociding by pig police in Minneapolis happened, um, we were neutralized and we were brainwashed once again, because once again, we don't have those systems in place because many of them have, have either been destroyed or have been completely assimilated to being in conjunction with the state um, with the petty bougie complex, uh, with the petty bougie class, and we are still reeling with those consequences, especially mm -hmm. with the uptick with the uptick in uh, fascism against everyone, 
it's a full-blown war against everyone because we once again we don't have those systems in place we tried to ignore reality for too long and you know we've seen we've seen the crack crisis we've seen the AIDS crisis we've seen all of these um these plights to essentially exterminate every one of us and you know the generations of mm-hmm. the past you know didn't do anything about it they just a lot of them a lot of them realistically they stood by and they did nothing knowing knowing that it was capitalism pulling on the strings it doesn't take a rocket scientist to see that but once again pointing the finger at the wrong people having the wrong entities um take over our destiny and take over these unions especially um here in chicago i mean the nonprofit <coughs> industrial complex has been you know having a huge presence here in chicago especially for the past three years um and you know the co-optation of revolution especially amongst um young people my fellow young people um you know and you know i've had i've i had enough you know this is you know this has gone on for too long and um you know that's why i'm making a liberation school now because like this cannot go on we have to be able to actually seize our destiny to seize the means of production to seize the means of a actually livable society i mean we already had that before colonization destroyed it but they want to call us you know underdeveloped and stuff which um okay but you know, the same thing still applies, you know, to our ancestral communities, to our ancestral homelands. You know, we have to seize the right for um, actual um, sustainable production of our land, of our history, you know, of, you know, the land that we walk on. And the longer that there are no survival systems in place, that there is no putting our foot down once and for all and say, this is enough. Uh, we, we don't have 50 more years of this. Let's do something now. The longer that we continue to keep ignoring what is going on in the now, like it, it, it does, is already having the worst consequences we've ever seen since um, uh, the initial Conto Pro program. But it's, it's something that we've never even, it's, um, a plight of fascism we had never even seen before, especially back in March. It ex- you know, everything exploded like an atomic bomb. Um, anti-trans laws being passed, ep- being passed or being um, drafted every damn where. If it happens in mm-hmm. one place, you, you render the entire place, you know, unlivable. It's unsafe, and we've seen the signs. We've seen the signs for years. But the past, gener- but many people of the past generations didn't do anything about it, and we're just here trying to pick up, um, um, trying to pull the strings and trying to um, fix what the past generations, uh, what most people of the, of the past generations have failed to do, even though they've seen this happen in front of them, even though they know the root causes. It's it's about that infiltration of revolution that has steeped so deep that even the youth are falling, that even the youth are falling for this. Even the youth are falling for it. So the fact of the matter is we have to put our foot down this time, for real this time, because we don't have 50 more years. We don't have 25 more years. No more excuses. No more excuses for anybody. And it will not be tolerated anymore. We have tried to ignore it every single time. And it's just ammunition against our life. It's ammunition against the land, against the earth that we live on. Because of fear, because of infiltrated distrust, because of resentment, pointing the fingers at the wrong people, even um, oppressing uh, every coming generation of children and youth um, in, in the conditions that, you know, we are in, 
in terms of colonialism and capitalism and um, neo-colonialism, you know, we are we are living the consequences of what happens when there's no kind of fight or system in place to reel us back in. And, it, you know, we've been steered away from that for so long that now we have all of this stuff happening, you know, and uh, even some of um, our revolutionary elders uh, from the black, from the original Black Panther Party, from the original Brown Berets, uh, from the original uh, Young Lords have called out themselves into being in conjunction, you know, with the state, which is why I say that we cannot romanticize the past because, I mean, we do have flaws, because they do have flaws just like us. They're human just like us, but even with that, at the same time, I do not care if you were on the steps of UCLA when Bunchy Carter was assassinated by Ron Karenga's men. I do not care that you were a Brown Beret 50 years ago. I don't care about that. I care about the now. What are you doing now? Are you still revolutionary? Are you still doing the work? Are you a fascist now? Are you working in conjunction with the state now? This is the system that we have to have in place to be sure that the fight of revolution still stays alive and that it's not being, you know, you know, we're having a gun or a knife up to our necks because there's no system in place. There's no sort, there's no um, putting our foot down and actually organizing in a revolutionary sense instead of trying to be closer with the same bourgeois uh, settler state empire that my ancestors were kidnapped to create. That's it. Uh, you brought up, uh, Comrade Shanti, you brought out some good points there. Uh, you brought out uh, kind of uh, the crack e epidemic and the AIDS epidemic, uh, and, and which was quite prevalent in the 80s. Uh, and then we can bring it up in today's time where it's still happening, but it's something different. Uh, it's still population control uh, with uh, COVID-19 and it's- uh, Exactly. Uh, it's, uh, 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 what, 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 do you, what do you call it? Uh, the, the, the things after COVID like uh, are, are different uh, like, mutations, of, mutations of COVID. Meets, and then, yeah. and then now we have the fentanyl or the whole opioid crisis oh, going crisis. on today. And um, and I like the way you mentioned, uh, and, and well, you said, uh, I, I don't really care what the people did back 50 years ago. Um, I helped create an elders council for the Brown Berets. And I, I do admire what they, they have done. So we have a, a Brown Beret elders council uh, to get their stories while we still have them so that we could learn from things they've already done in the past, what worked in the past and what didn't work in the past. So we can bring that into today's times as revolutionary soldiers. And I'm proud to call myself a Chicano revolutionary nationalist for the nation of Aslan. Of course, of course with scientific socialism uh, background also. Uh, but uh, the, you did a couple of good points there. And I, I, you said something else too, but I, I guess I was talking too much and then like, I think too much and like, but it, it's, it's, it's nice to hear a perspective of a 19 year old uh, because, and when we have these study groups, uh, we have somebody in their 70s, 50s, 40s, 30s, 20s, and so forth, right. and in their teens. And, and what, what would you like to say? That's all I had to say. Well, Andy oh, has his hand up. Oh, nothing. Um, I was just, I was just agreeing with what you said, and you know, Asan, yeah, Asan is real. Okay. Yes, yes, it is. <laughs> uh, comrade Andy, you have your hand up, and thank you for being patient. Go ahead. I, I, yeah, yeah, I think this is really invaluable. I agree with, I would agree with you, Joe, about this, uh, this cross current of ideas and stuff like that. I would say, I'll tell you right now, when I was working uh, in the seventies and eighties, if somebody had told me we were going to lose uh, hundreds of thousand people to opioid crisis and two million people to a pandemic that no, and we would have no medical care. We would have no provisions. You know, we would have no treatments. We would have no, um, you know, 
anything. I would I would have called you a liar, even though I was a revolutionary back then. I would I would say no, you you're totally out of your mind. You're paranoid. You know this is not going to happen. I would not have believed it because it was unbelievable. The reality was we had we had we had much better economic situ situation for working class people, even though we may have scraped by a little bit, but it was nothing like what people are facing today. I mean, my uh, you know, these these young people that ride around doing Grubhub and DoorDash and Uber and Lyft and any other damn thing they can do, they're working themselves into an early grave. They're working 12 hours a day, running all over the place. They got, you know, they got no health care, nothing. As this um, young driver the other day, he says to us, we're on our way to the hospital, get some tests done. And he's, he's got going, I wake up every morning. I, I need a tooth removed. I got, you know, he said, I don't know what to do. He said, I, I need, could you tell me when we're going to get free health care? in this in this place you know and it's it's insane the way it's going down the young people are right to be impatient and they're right to be perturbed with the inadequacies that they were uh, that was left to them by their by the earlier generations earlier generations had their head in the sand they didn't want to look at what was happening right in front of them. They didn't want to hear about the pollution. These people, people have been known about what was coming for years. Exxon was writing internal memos 60, 70 years ago that this stuff was polluting the planet. So we, I make no excuse for myself or for my generation. I I have sincere hope that we're going to be able to unite and we're going to, we're going to do it much in the way. I don't know if com comrades have watched Captain Africa's uh, confrontation with the mayor of Newark, New Jersey. Yes, it's yes, really it instructive because that's, that's what's coming. We have all these, uh, um, you know, uh, Black and brown, we have them here in Chicago, all these different politicians, you know, they're going to help you, they're progressive, they're this or that. What Shanti was saying was absolutely true, that they are, they're sitting on top of everything, and they got all the power, and, they, and they're constantly telling us to be patient, be still, and we're, wait a minute, we w the revolutionaries are going to be the ones like Captain Africa are going to say, no, you're a sellout. You're betraying the people. Why are all these people homeless? Why 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 is nobody asking uh, these politicians why the the tent cities are popping up in every park and every underpass in Chicago? And you know somebody like Delhi Ramirez who I've known for ten years runs around talking about like, oh, I'm I'm writing home legislation for homes and this and that. I'm doing this and that. you ain't doing nothing. And and you actually have lied to the people. She told a bunch of homeless people, well go down to the South Side, get yourself a, a apartment down there, and then in a year or so I'll I'll have you an apartment up here and you know my they came to my friend, they said, what's she telling them? He said well, if she could get you a place in a year, just stay here for a year. Let her get her a place right now. Don't go down to the south side. And so it's like we are being been lied to at every turn by people who, you know, are so-called progressive and stuff like that. And the revolutionaries actually are going to be the ones who take up the the battle cry of the people we're going to be the, we're going to stand between the people and these lying politicians and expose them i don't know how many times it's going to be done but it's going to be happening all the time pretty soon because we're getting nothing we're getting nothing but lies a handful of promises and that's all we got
So I, I'm really encouraged by the young people seeing through all of it, seeing how desperate their situation is and how little time we got to do anything. Uh, thank you, Comrade Andy. Uh, I know uh, Comrade Sean uh, has his hand up, but we'll go to him next. But like I, like you were saying, like back in the 70s, my grandpa says, watch, one day they're going to sell water. I was like, Grandpa, how can they sell water? And and look, look at, they sell water. <laughs> they sell water. And I said, well, to now I'm saying like one day they're going to, they're going to bottle up oxygen, which they already do, but they're going to bottle yep. up, a, you know, air and stuff. And they're going to be selling air. And I, I'm a strong well, believer in, in the revolutionary that there are people that don't deserve to breathe the same air we breathe because they're wasting, they're wasting it. They're not doing anything productive. Yep. Uh, yeah. But anyway, we got Comrade Sean raise his hand. Uh, can we go to him next, please? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Comrade Joe. Um, you know, honestly, listening to Shanti and all of the speakers speak today, um, even you know, with my personal distractions, uh, it's brought me to thinking about the time I spent working with the. Uh, uh, gig workers union for you know uber drivers lyft drivers and so on and so forth um we'd often pair up with uh, the fight for 15 and you know just watching all of these actions and this was not even that long ago this i'd say three four years ago um i'm still friends with the two organizers you know most directly above me um but you know just watching uh the societal, you know, like the police, the uh, mayors and who would show up and, you know, just quietly observe, you know, these little actions going on. And just that brings me to my next point is, you know, like most counter-revolutionary actions are already we're being outthunk by think tanks, like legit think tanks you know, with billions of dollars at their mm -hmm. disposal to come up with, um, you know, how to fight this sort of stuff. And, you know, like it is horrifying to see, you know, no social progression since I was a child. And, you know, and I was born in like uh, December 85, you know, growing up and, you know, seeing a lot of the uh, media like, um uh, hunchback of Notre Dame and you know it's like some of the other you know things that came out during those times Captain Planet you know um it kind of shapes a whole bunch of kids and you know I see a lot of my friends who are interested in this stuff but they don't do anything about it you know and not a damn thing has gotten better like we all got raised on Sesame Street <laughs> Um, cause you know, that was the thing. And like, I don't see any commonality with some people at times. And it horrifies me that I feel like that. Cause I try to have love for everybody, even just on a basic level. Hi, you're human. I may not like your opinion, <laughs> but, uh, you know, like it, not a damn thing has gotten better. In fact, the division has so gotten so much worse. Um, you know, honestly, like uh, back to the union stuff, um, watching Uber throw $200 million into an advertising campaign against uh, Prop 22. And um, all we had was our little phone bank of all volunteers and a few union members, you know, kind of directing the things. But, you know, they're not really supposed to. I do a whole heck of a lot, though they did make calls. Um, we reached like two million people just by ourselves and our thumbs. Um, and to lose by such a narrow loss, like forever, you know, is implanted in my heart because, like, I almost enacted a change. Um, we did get another prop passed before then that kind of made things better for a minute. But then Prop 22 actually killed any of that progression. Um, but 
they did take the blueprint of that and transpose it to the European gig workers. And I believe that passed. I'll have to double check on that. Um, but, you know, they they had uh, some of the representatives fly out from here to there on relatively short notice um, to speak on behalf of the gig workers in California doing what they were doing. Um, I think that's it, you know, because I kind of lost where I was going with it. But, you know, you guys got to feel for it. Uh, thank, thank you. Uh, I know we also have Sister Yesenia on here tonight, not to put her on blast, but it, I wanted to at least give you a chance if you did want to say something or you're free to pass not to not to just throw your name out there like that. Is there any take on anything that you would like to share tonight, Sister? Uh, if not, uh, it's understandable. Hello, everybody. Thank you, Joe. Um, so, yes, I hope the Chicano Moratorium went well. And everything went good for everyone who went out there. Um, and from the reading, what really stuck out to me was you can't separate the personal and the politics. I believe that was the line. Um, and that kind of re reminded me of everything we do in our lives is affected by politics, by other people, by people who hold the wealth, hold the control of the lower class um, even if they promote themselves for the community and you know do give out scholarships and whatnot the way they run their institutions is still a racist classist degrading way um, and I didn't know all of this about the unions I thought the unions were um, were good for the people for everybody but it makes sense, um, especially if you're fighting for scraps and then people try to keep dividing and keep uh, separation. And um, it just reminded me of the movie about the Chicano who created the Hot Cheetos. I don't know if anyone's seen it. I can't remember what it's called. But pretty much he came up at, from a janitor, being a janitor, and being told to stay in his place and not to, you know, cause any disturbance. And he challenged that, and he went above everybody's head, above his supervisors, above the managers and everything. And he ended up getting recognized, and he saved the company because they were going under. And so he ended up being promoted to multicultural director, I believe. Um but he really had a fight and really he was told by everybody to just stay in this place um because that's the way things work but think but change doesn't happen unless people stand up together and resist um and it just reminds me of when joe was sharing his story with me about how he stood up and he you know well i don't want to share the story is it okay if i share your story we're all amongst comrades okay um, and then he ended up being fired because they weren't paying him the drive time. They were driving four hours pretty much extra a day, um, especially when they're doing specialty work. And um, they got the work done. And so he stood up and he said, no, like, you guys aren't paying us enough. You guys need to, you started off paying us and now you're taking that away. Um, and he got fired. But because of that, other people recognized him and stood up and I believe they changed the policies. That's correct. They still fired me, but um, it worked out in favor for those that stood working. So I was happy about that. <laughs> it's amazing the fucking audacity that some of these labor exploiters have to really like feel entitled to free labor, not just cheap labor, but free labor. It's like, get the fuck out of here. Get the absolute fuck out of here. <laughs> they still do that losing pipeline. That, I mean, they're still they're, they're still putting people to work to either make license plates or and down south you still um, hard labor. You're working in the field, repairing the roads, picking the uh, pick the, the 
uh, what you call it, the agriculture out there. So they're still doing that. That's all. It's shameful and fucking unethical. Uh, Comrade Andy, I see you got your hand up. <laughs> yeah, I just I want to make it clear that like uh, about the whole business about the union, it's always it always has been a, a two edged thing. I mean, the the history of the labor movement in this country is is totally filled with uh, you know racist uh, you know division and uh, one one group advancing over another and the, the divisions were there the divisions are the are lessening only in that they're not they don't want to pay anybody to do anything they don't care what color you are they you're useless to them i mean that the, the why uh, why would you have like all these people addicted to opioids and just left to die well it's like that represents a threat to the to the ruling class. I'm not saying they plotted this, but they're perfectly comfortable with a large section of the uh, working class dying off, either through war or opioids or what, whatever, because they don't have uh, gainful employment for them. So therefore, they become a threat. So that's all. We're we're all the way they perceive the vast majority of people more and more that they no longer need because, like, they they're laying them off by the thousands. You know, they don't need them. They got they got the AI to work with the phone or whatever, uh, chat bot, whatever. Uh, uh, get them, get them do all this stuff. So the bargaining power of the working class as a whole is less and less and less. It's dropping incrementally, but it's all it's this exponential speed. And here's one of the things that happened. My friend just texted me a bunch of stuff. Like we've had this Amazon warehouse built here for over a year. And the people in the neighborhood, and we, my, my wife and I were part of this struggle, we, we hooked up with the Teamsters and we said, we want a guarantee of a community benefit uh, to, to our community and jobs should be uh, given to people in the community priority. They, we should have a green sector. We want, we want, we were we were starting to demand a, a parks and recreation in these in these communities because the, where they built was a very uh, rough and uh, you know deteriorating side, part of the west side. Well, Amazon wasn't going to cut a deal like that with the with the city or with the community or nothing, and so they waited and they waited and they waited. Well, guess what? Now we got ten thousand. Uh, immigrants come to Chicago. They don't have housing. They don't have jobs. Amazon just decided to open up the warehouse after a year of leaving it abandoned. And I'm that's where they're going to play us. They're going to play. They're going to play the immigrant against the black resident. They're going to play the white against the black as usual. All these tricks and um, uh, games that they're going to play with us. If we don't figure out how to do that, how to outsmart them at that level, and we can. All their think tanks, not one of them have been able to figure out how to permanently keep the, the working class divided. But they're all devoted to that. That's what they get the billions and billions of dollars in those think tanks. Keep this class divided. Keep this class divided. That's a single, singular message from Heritage, uh, Cato, uh, uh, the Hoover Institute, any of these big think tanks. Their their main purpose is to divide the working class. So all we got to do, our single purpose is to unite the working class and unite them in a revolutionary uh, direction. Teamsters wouldn't do it. Teamsters bullshit us. They they tell us about told us a bunch of lies about how they were going to do this and that. They didn't do a damn thing. Um, so we we can chart a clear path 
and and by having the young young people who were looking for that path, looking for the revolutionary path, we just we just have to uh, provide the clarity and the uh, um, discipline and the de determination. We don't be fooled again, like that, whatever that old song was from my generation. I don't know what it was, but. We won't be fooled again. George Bush tried to quote it; he screwed it up. Um, but um, we're we're on we're on the right path. What we have to do is consolidate and continue to outreach to the people who are desperate. The people who are the people who are desperate are going to be the army that gets rid of this system. On the tip of unions, like as far as the big ones like UAW and the Teamsters and whatnot, they're fucked because they're being run in the same exact manners as our government is, um, all the way down to the nepotism, all that bullshit. Um, versus ones that have still like kind of held on to their original ideology are, are you know few and far between, but from what I understand, the IWW does still have a solid political line. Um, and I'm seeing ones pop up like the, the Amazon union that's being led by Chris, uh, I believe his last name is Smalls. Um, he is a straight up comrade. He is a communist and he's, you know, uniting people under the Amazon union with correct ideology and, you know, they're, they're setting it up where it's not going to be run in those fucked manners like what's happened to some of the larger unions. And I'm glad to see that so we do need to unionize workers, but under the initial grounds of what they were originally formed for to actually seize the fucking means, not to just be asking for a slightly larger pittance. Um, so I, I'm glad to see that growth happening there with uh these these unions that are popping up in a grassroots manner and going well hey we do have, we definitely need this but we're not going to allow it to be run like those other ones are that are fucked up um so I, i'm glad to see that it it's absolutely necessary we need to see more of that we need to see unions getting back to their fucking roots to not be allowed to run in fucked manners like the government does because at that point they're not doing anything of any benefit for the workers and that's where their focus right. needs to be is right. workers rights of yep. you know seeking that full ownership of of the value of your labor um actually having safe work conditions you know, things like that that have been crushed by the government. You know, fuck, look at just, you know, about a year ago with the railway workers being on strike, not for greater pay or anything. They'd already gotten what they wanted as far as their pay increase. They were striking because of fucked working conditions, whether it be unsafe conditions at the job site or the unsafe conditions of them being overworked of extremely long fucking shifts and being on call 24 fucking seven where they might get a day off every few months and the the days that they are working they are working insanely long hours we're not talking some normal eight to ten hour shift no 14 16 20 hour fucking shifts where they're exhausted and then expected to be able to run this heavy fucking machinery of trades going across the country and a lot of what they were pointing out is the infrastructure itself being so old and fucking dilapidated and unkept that it's a risk to every fucking community that they drive those trains through. And no sooner did Biden fuck them over and order everybody back to work and literally try to criminalize them actually striking then we turn around and have a fucking, you know, train wreck in Ohio that contaminated the whole fucking area, all of the soil, all of the water. These motherfuckers did one of the dumbest things that they could have done and set the shit ablaze, pretending like that was something they were doing as a protective measure when really the products of that reaction 
are just as fucking toxic as if they had just let the contents of the polyvinyl chloride itself spill. It, it was no better. It, it wasn't helping anything. But we have, you know, an entire city having to be evacuated. We have workers at high health risk from having to handle that shit. Why? Because they didn't want to fucking listen to the workers saying that we need to, you know, actually invest in the infrastructure. We need to actually lay new railways. We need to actually, you know, update the fucking trains themselves and stop using these old shit boxes that are rickety as fuck and falling apart because they're older than most of us are. You know, it's ridiculous that the rest of the world is using stuff like bullet trains that are run on magnetic tracks and we're over here still burning fossil fuels to pull shit boxes it's ridiculous they should have shut the fuck up and listened to their workers and actually done what the workers were demanding because the workers are the ones in the ground actually having to contend with it every day who know what those circumstances are and what the results will be of not fucking taking care of these problems but, of course, the fucking government backed these bourgeoisie cunts who own the railway companies. Like, no, they don't need to invest in anything. They don't need to fix anything. Just carry the fuck on and keep fucking the environment up and fucking your workers up. Go for it. And it's all fucked. This is one more reason why there needs to be collective ownership of these things. Because here in this system... These rich fucks who don't give a shit who they harm with their business practices are being allowed to impose their absolute fucking sociopathy on not just their workers, but all of the communities that they have to work in. So, pisses me off. Pisses me right the fuck off. If you can't tell. <laughs> Shit's got to change. Positive sister, positive. Uh, I guess that's what we should say. Um, we always have to, be, you know, if you stay ready, you don't have to get ready. So a lot of times, a lot of things that we're, we're addressing now, it actually takes boots on the ground efforts um, and, um, and rallies and marches and awarenesses. And then comrade Andy brought out um, uh, uh, Captain Africa and his problems that he's having uh, when he had when he went up with the mayor and told him like, hey, like, what about, you know, what's going on with this homelessness crisis and they arrest him and all this other stuff. I was on that study group or on that, that meeting yesterday. And I was like, I, I just wanted to share my support and my uh, my strong backing for Captain Africa. And, and this is what we have to do as revolutionary brothers and sisters uh, because um, it's very, very hard, and we can't do it alone. It, collectively, we are strong and all power to the people. That's all. All right. All, right. all power. I absolutely agreed. All power. Captain Africa was out there literally calling them out for things like evicting an elderly woman who is wheelchair bound. She is disabled. And he was like, how the fuck do you expect her to just, you know, come up with a bunch of fucking money that you're demanding here in order to keep her home? She has the right to keep her home. You know, you're kicking her out on the streets with nowhere to go and she's disabled. What the fuck is she supposed to do? He did not deserve to be arrested for that. If anything, the fucking mayor, Ras Baraka, deserved to be arrested for that because he's harming the community. That motherfucker ran on a platform of pretending to be revolutionary revolutionary and wanting to help the community and all he has done since he took that office is fucking sell the community out to these fucking gentrifying investor assholes and captain africa was well within his fucking right to be calling that shit out and defending the community um. yeah amen to that Kind of makes me wish we had like funding coming in to cover comrades traveling out there to put boots to the ground and back them on this. 
Um, Comrade Africa um, had, uh, Captain Africa had mentioned um, he has a kind of a, I don't know if it's a GoFundMe or something like that. Um, he posted it yesterday. I don't have it. Uh, Comrade Zen, were you on that uh, study yesterday or on, on that uh, on that group conversation? Yes, I was. Um, for most of it, I, I had some connective issues with my phone yesterday, too, but I got to hear most of it. Um, I do not recall the, the cash app that they're using for that fundraising, but I believe that's to help him and his family with the legal expenses of, exactly. of his attorneys. Um, give me just exactly. a second. And, and, if, and if when you find it or if you find it, if you can put it here into the Rainbow Coalition uh, chat group uh, and share it with me personally, mm -hmm. And I can uh, share it with uh, some of our brown or our, our brown beret comrades, uh, because you know uh, that can happen to any one of us as activists, um, and we definitely have to support one another. Um, fortunately, we got a little. Uh, we got some brown berets now have um, some civil rights attorneys uh, helping us uh, in specific things like when things like that happen. Um, who knows? Um, Maybe I can get them to help uh, help him too, but I know they're they're um, they're they're legally able to work in Arizona, California, and Colorado. So, uh, but I don't know if they're able to do something out there where Captain Africa is at. Um, but they may know someone um, um, that can help. So, and do it pro bono. That's all. Um, I yeah, just and, messaged Comrade Africa and patients to ask them what the cash app is for that legal fund. Um, so I will let you all know as soon as I get a reply from them. I was just going to say you can watch the whole, you can watch the discussion from yesterday. It was it's taped and available. Um, and, uh, you know, it's real. I think it's really useful because I believe it's going to happen everywhere. We have a situation where in Chicago we have a progressive mayor. Everybody said, yeah, well, we'll take him over this uh, Paul Vallis, who's an outright uh, fascist pig, um, oper CIA operative. Yeah, we'll take this guy. So he's in there, but right away he followed through on a deal that was cooked up by Lori Lightfoot to hand over public property to a billionaire owner of the Chicago Fire soccer team. Lori cooked up this deal where she was going to give this guy this uh, big piece of uh, real estate, and he was going to pay for it, but it was public land. It was supposed to be used to provide public housing. So the people have asked, the people came out in the street and say, hey, what's going on? Uh, you know, they were down at City Hall, a big group of people saying, "You, we elected you to provide housing. We elected you to do this and we elected you to do that. We didn't elect you to give away public property to a billionaire. It's a cycle. So the, I mean, it's, 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 a, yeah, and it's like happening everywhere. It's sort of like, Two, like Che used to say, two, three men in Vietnam. By that, he meant that if we have enough uprisings going on all over the world, we'll be able to bring the, the beast down. And in a way, it's two, three many Newarks or two, three many Chicagos, two, three many Los Angeleses, because the, these things are happening everywhere. Newark just happens to be the poorest urban uh uh, city in the country, I believe. I mean, it might be Gary, Indiana. I mean, but we got people everywhere. At this point, the Second Rainbow Coalition is coast to coast. These are the problems that only we seem to be willing to address. So we're going to be do doing some, we're going to be busy. <laughs> we're going to be getting busy. Yeah. Hell yeah.
Um, Comrade Africa just sent me the link for the Cash App. I put it in the chat here for anybody who is watching in the audience. If you'd like to donate to Captain Africa's legal fund, the Cash App is dollar sign. I live for the people. Thank you. Thank you, comrade. If you can send it to me directly, because I ain't that smart and it takes me a little longer. Um, I don't know how to do it, get it from here and then and then work with it. So um, if you can do that, to send it to me separately, I'd appreciate it. Okay, I'm sending it to you on Messenger right now. Thank you. There you go. You're welcome, comrade. Okay, we are a little over two hours right now, um, so we should probably wrap up the recording soon here. If anybody has any thoughts uh, in conclusion on, on today's chapter and all the things that we have been discussing here. Uh, well, I, I, I found, I remember the name of the movie. <laughs> it's called Salt of the Earth, and it was filmed in Mexico because the message was such a communist message, they wouldn't allow it to be filmed in, in the United States. I believe that's correct. Uh, uh, but anyway, so it, it, it has a real famous uh, Mexican actress as a star of it. And uh, she, I believe, was a communist. So great movie. I'm going to have to check that out. Thank you for the movie recommendation, Comrade Andy. Yeah. If nobody else has any uh, thoughts and conclusion here, then I guess we can wrap this up here. Uh, as usual, if you'd like, I can leave the room open so the conversation can continue. I just didn't want the recording to be too long. <laughs> Yeah, we can close the recording and then we can say our final words. Um, thank you, sister, comrade. Thank you, comrade Joe. All right, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. All power to the people. 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 Free the land. Free the land. Free the land. Damn right, comrade. <laughs> and the, the land belongs to those that work it. Uh, That's right. Fuck the, That's right. the ruling class. <laughs> right. oh, sorry, no. I don't like to cuss that much, but there sometimes, you go. sometimes you get your point across a little better, you know. That's right. That's right. Right. These words exist for emphasis. Fuck the bourgeoisie. <laughs> <laughs> Ha, ha, ha.